And this generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. He said because it is there. Well, space is there. Welcome to episode 13 of That Space Show. I'm your host as always, Nick. Thank you guys, thank you. And we're gonna be going over the dates, April 29th through April 30th, which is Wednesday, today, 2024, of course. And we have a very interesting story, so if you're interested, stick around. That's gonna be posted at the timestamp I'm gonna put on the screen, but I suggest just watching the entire video because I mean, so much interesting news, am I right? So without further ado, let's get straight into it. And I'd like to thank the new subs that have their public subscriptions turned on. Michael, Cloverfield, Gerard, Nick, Slater X, Geo, Dead Mouse, Christopher, John, Vigie, and Newsman Ahmed. Thank you so much for subscribing. And if you want to be featured in this area, just have your public subscriptions turned on. Easier than that. And thank you to these comments on the screen I'm going to be putting up. And if you want to be in this, of course, just leave a comment and you should be on there. And then for astronomy, we have just today the moon at the last quarter. So if you're out, check that out, of course. And then launches, actually. We've had two of them moved. The Falcon on Block 5, Roadview Legion 1 and 2 moved to Thursday, May 2nd at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time Zone. And the Falcon 9 Block 5 Starlink Group 6255, that's going to be Thursday as well at 9.17 p.m. Eastern Time Zone. And then we have the Long March 5 Change 6, which is going to be Friday, May 3rd, 2024, of course, at 5.30 a.m. Eastern Time Zone. So I'm going to put that one in, but there's also another one going on later that day, but I'll have that one actually on the next episode on Friday. Bruh. So without further ado... Astrobiology and astrophysics. Let's get straight down to business. Using James Webb, astronomers have created a detailed map of the temperature of a gas exoplanet named WASP 43b. Now, WASP 43b, I'm sure you've heard of before, but it's tidally locked to a star, so the side facing the star can actually reach temperatures of 2,282 degrees Fahrenheit. And the cooler side stays to a cool 1,112 degrees Fahrenheit. And now, why is it so hot? The dark side is so warm because there are violent winds which carry the hot air to the other side, which causes actually clouds to form. These clouds are so thick that they actually hinder the formation of methane, which is expected. Hot Jupiter-type planets are interesting to study because scientists get insights to the extreme planetary conditions that are all out there. And now, these conditions, of course, happen because of how close to the host star this planet is. And WASP-43b is a great look into the diverse climates of all these exoplanets. And now onto the moon Celadus, which of course orbits Saturn. It experiences a strange phenomenon named tidal heating due to Saturn's gravitational pull. The stretch causes Enceladus to actually change shape, resulting in squeezing and stretching known as tidal forces. These forces generate enough heat within Celadus to keep a global ocean liquid beneath its actual icy surface. At Enceladus' south pole, there are long faults called tiger stripe faults. And now, these faults emit jets, actually, of icy particles into space, forming a plume above the moon's surface. Samples from this plume suggest conditions suitable for life may exist in Saladis's subsurface ocean. Researchers believe this plume intensity could actually be caused by a strike slip, which is actually similar to Earth's earthquakes here, of course. The researchers actually theorized that these jets occur along specific points along these faults where they actually pull apart due to the strike and slip motion. Now, this hypothesis is actually supported by geological evidence found at the Tiger Stripe region. This could honestly help us learn more about the habitability of Celadus. Very cool. Who knew that? And now, last one. In the core of the Milky Way, astronomers are actually puzzled by the absence of pulsars. This mystery has led researchers to consider things like dark matter, neutron stars, and primordial black holes, PBHs, as possible explanations. A team of astronomers actually wanted to investigate and found that a magnetar actually more orbits the black hole at the center of the galaxy, which challenges their previous explanation for the absence of pulsars. The team explored the idea of neutron stars consuming these 
old black holes to explain the missing pulsars. The team simulated multiple scenarios where millisecond pulsars interacted with these black holes. They found that these interactions couldn't fully explain the missing pulsars, suggesting that there could be more complex dynamics at play. While the black holes could play a role, it does not seem like they would be the only factor in this. There's honestly so much more work to be done on this, but it could open up a new field of study. Very cool. And Now, James Webb again. The James Webb Telescope has been put to the test using a mode named Aperture Masking Interferometry, AMI, and this mode uses the telescope's near-infrared imager and slitless spectrograph, N-I-R-I-S-S, to achieve very high spatial resolution. The team of astronomers use this to observe a previously mentioned extrasolar system named PDS-70, which I think we actually mentioned in the first ever episode. Now, this, again, to give you a reminder, has two young planets orbiting a young star, and even cooler, these planets are the only known ones to orbit within a protoplanetary disk, where planets actually form. Now, the James Webb Telescope easily detected both planets and found evidence of disk material all around them, where moons could actually form. Additionally, the observations revealed a mysterious third source of light near one of the planets. This source could be another planet, part of a proplanetary disk, or something else entirely. This is actually an important milestone in astronomy as this is the first time actually planets have been detected using this new type of AMI. Very, very cool. And now, again, James Webb Telescope has been doing a lot. It's actually captured a stunningly detailed infrared images of Horse Head Nebula, a famous celestial object in the constellation Orion. Now, these new images reveal the structures at the top edge of the nebula where the gas and dust glow under the influence of ultraviolet light from nearby stars. The Horse Head Nebula is what scientists call a PDR, where ultraviolet radiation from young massive stars interact with the surrounding gas and dust. And these regions actually offer valuable insights into the physical and chemical processes of shaping the evolution of interstellar matter. They've also detected striated patterns containing dust particles and ionized gas, which shedding light on the complex dynamics within the new nebula. By studying the spectroscopic data collected by, of course, James Webb, astronomers hope to uncover more about the actual physical and chemical properties of the Horsehead Nebula and its surrounding environment, especially with all the radiation. And then, guess what? Actually, not James Webb, it's Hubble. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope shows this striking central bar of NGC 2217. Now, the central bar is a pro predominant feature in the galaxies like NGC 2217, and it actually plays a crucial role in their evolution. It serves as a conduit channeling gas from the galaxy's disk towards the center. This gas and dust can either form new stars or be consumed by a supermassive black hole, which, of course, is at the galaxy's core. Very cool. Base tech. And now, NASA's Mars Sample Return mission, of course, as mentioned, is still facing criticism due to high cost and timeline. So NASA has decided to gather some maybe ideas from the community. The samples wanting to be returned are from the Jezero Crater, which could have hosted a lake. This mission is very important in understanding how to get humans to Mars, but also transporting goods from one planet to the other. NASA needs to reduce the budget though, especially if this is going to be a common occurrence in the future. NASA received ideas from the community such as designing smaller lighter rovers, exploring novel drilling and sampling methods to cut costs and improve efficiency. Interacting with academia is important as if NASA wants to really continue this in the future, they must find ways to be efficient. And now the Einstein probe, a space telescope launched by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, CAS, in collaboration with the European Space Agency, has recently shared its first images. This mission aims to explore the universe through X-ray light. Since January 2024, the Einstein probe has been conducting many tests and fixing its instruments. Its early observations have already revealed new X-ray sources such as transient events, such as gamma ray bursts, and flaring stars. 
The mission's ability to quickly detect and monitor these events will help scientists better understand high-energy phenomena in the cosmos, such as neutron star collisions and black hole activity. The Einstein probe has been groundbreaking already in its X-ray event records and will continue alongside the European Space Agency's XMM Newton and the Japan's XRISM. Very cool. And now the European Galileo navigation system has launched two more satellites into orbit, bringing the total number up to 30. Since its operational debut in 2016, Galileo has played a crucial role in various sectors such as transportation, agriculture, finance, and rescue operations. It's actually estimated that 10% of the EU's GDP actually relies on satellite navigation and this dependent is only expected to grow. Now looking ahead, the remaining eight Galileo first generation satellites will be launched soon, followed by the introduction of the second gen G2 of satellites expected in 2026. Now, these G2 satellites will feature improved capabilities, including electric propulsion, advanced navigation antennas, better atomic clocks, and actually fully digital payloads. I wonder what those can be. And the European Space Agency is continuing to evolve as one can just tell from this. Oh, the most exciting story, I believe, actually on this channel. So, space exploration, let's get straight into it. Professor Niku Medusudan at Cambridge University, he was studying some data from another exoplanet, and he ended up finding something that could be a very high indicator of life. Planet K218b was the first exoplanet which for the first time has shown detections of carbon-bearing molecules like methane and CO2, which indicates there could be oceans. Deeper into this analysis, Professor Niku believes there is a very high possibility of dimethyl sulfide. This is so important because on Earth, it is only produced from lifelike organisms in the Earth's oceans. And now, Professor Niku states, it has been known to be a robust biomarker if detected in a planetary environment, and it has been predicted to be so. He believes that this could be the one as the presence of the gas that is there, the oceans, water, and possibly the life that could be giving off this gas. Now, guess what? James Webb is currently beaming on this planet right now to form an analysis, and it could be, of course, months or maybe a year before they confirm really anything. Niku states that he believes it could actually be a 50-50 chance there's life based on past observations they've made. This could be groundbreaking, and I will keep updating everyone on this until we find out if there's life or not. I'm so excited to actually find out the updates from this. And now our next story. In the coming months, two of NASA's spacecraft around Mars will closely be watching the sun, but why? Because the sun is going through a phase called solar maximum, where it's particularly active, releasing strong bursts of energy called, of course, solar flares. These flares can send out harmful radiation to space, which can pose risks to future astronauts and robots on Mars. Mars, of course, does not have a strong magnetic field to protect it from these solar storms. So to deal with this, NASA's MAVEN orbiter and the Curiosity rover are teaming up. MAVEN, which is orbiting high above Mars, monitors these radiation levels while Curiosity on the Martian surface measures how much radiation reaches down to the ground. Not only will we learn about the safety, but also more about the past. I'm so excited. And that's going to wrap up episode 13. I hope you enjoyed all the news stories. I mean... There's so many interesting things, possibility of life, Mars, so much more. And of course, if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell because we're uploading three days a week, Monday, uh, Wednesday, and Friday. I mean, who doesn't want that much space news? I mean, Bruh. I know I would like that much, but of course, without further ado, remember, be bold. Be original. Be invincible. <laughs> <laughs>